delighted to be here today. First of all, I'd like to welcome all of you to this beautiful campus. I think the jewel of the campuses at Rutgers University. And um, I'm so happy that we have this event where I get to address you um, on the site that has been my home for the past 22 years. I'm not going to talk too much about my science, even though you might get uh, have some laughs to learn some things about sexual behavior in goats and cattle <laughs> and sheep. Uh, I'm more interested, actually, in doing in making myself a little uncomfortable. And I'm going to be uncomfortable because I'm going to talk about myself. It's not something I do very often. My wife might disagree with me on that. <laughs> Ordinarily, I, I address groups of students in the public to talk about biology and reproduction and endocrinology and physiology and, and topics that relate to our extension programming around the state and the exciting areas in, in science, engineering, and technology for our youth, nutrition education to address childhood obesity, and, and hunger issues, to talk to farming groups about food production, local food, everybody these days is talking about wondering where their food comes from, and, and New Jersey is indeed the garden state. We have tremendous productivity in our agriculture systems. But I'm going to talk about my own life. Why my own life? I love this place, Rutgers. I didn't know that I would when I came here 22 years ago. I was a little frightened to come to New Jersey um, because, you know, Jay Leno or others like him always have their, their wisecracks about this, about this place. I've come to love it very much, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself and why I've come to love this place and why uh, my wife and I um, agreed that uh, we would in fact become members of this august uh, body of the Colonel Henry Rutgers Society. And if I could digress for a second, I would like to introduce uh, the, the love of my life for the past 35 years, Dr. Barbara Tarbell. A lot of places I could begin. I want to tell you about uh, Reuben and Esther Katz first, um, my father and my mother. And neither one of them went to college. Uh, my father was an electrical contractor. He ran his own company for many years. They met uh, shortly after World War II and uh, married um, within a few months of, of meeting one another and were married uh, uh, for more than 50 years before, before my dad passed, my mother a few years later. Despite the fact that they never went, had a, a higher education experience, their goal was to put their children through college, and, and that they did. There were five of us, and, and education was, was a critical piece in our household from very early days. I remember as a, as a young boy when, when uh, my dad bought the World Book Encyclopedia, and it sat on the shelves in our living room, and we, the family would eat uh, dinner together. We always ate dinner together. Five o'clock was dinner time. It didn't matter what was going on, who I was playing with outside. We were in the house at five o'clock for dinner with the family. And the conversations uh, ranged all sorts of topics from politics to science to, to what, happened, what was happening in the news that day. And when something came up that we didn't know the answer to, Dad said, Larry, go to the World Book. <laughs> let's, let's see what the encyclopedia has to say about it. So there was always this, this great drive to learn, and, and uh, they worked very hard to put us, to put us through school. So I thought I want, first I thought I wanted to be a doctor and then realized, but I really love animals and I had my German Shepherds and I thought, well, I should be a veterinarian then because then I can, I can help these animals. So I went to Cornell University thinking that I'm going to become a veterinarian. And you take the classes, much as the students do in the animal science department here, that, that will help prepare you for a veterinary degree. And you realize, boy, this is really competitive to get into vet schools. There are very few at the time. I was a, an undergraduate. There were only 13 vet schools in the country. And as a resident of the state of New York, really the only choice for me would have been to stay right at uh, Cornell. And they only took about 45 students in their class. And I was not a straight A student. So I was a little worried about uh, my chances of getting accepted. So I knew I needed to add to my experience level by doing something beyond the classroom. And I was in a course, <laughs> happened to be a reproductive physiology course. And the graduate student who was running the lab at the time said, I need a volunteer to help with some research this weekend, Saturday morning, come on out to the to one of our farms on the, that was just off the edge of the campus. The word research was new to me. I had never, you know, here I was, a, a junior in college, and, and as great as that school up the street from here uh, may be, research was not really part of the curriculum uh, for the undergraduate students. So I thought, well, let's go find out what it is, and I like this guy anyway. 
So we met out that Saturday morning out of the farm, and I got to work with bulls. And these animals were enormous. And they would just as soon run over you and gore you as, as look at you. And the work we had to do, I won't go into the details, but it was rather, let's just say it was rather intimate. But I, I learned a lot, and I had the time in my life. And I, and I said, well, how can I do some more of this? He said, well, you have to talk to my advisor. That's Dr. Foote. Turns out Dr. Foote um, was the instructor in the course I was taking. So I went to his Monday morning. First thing Monday morning, I went to his office. I asked the secretary if I could see Dr. Foote. She said, sure, go ahead. And I walked in the office. I said, Dr. Foote, I spent the weekend with Tom on the farm. I really loved what I was doing. I was wondering if you had some position where I could work in, in your lab or on, on your research. And he said, well, what's your name? And I told him my name. He said, Larry, I don't have anything for you right now, but things change, so why don't you check back with me another time? I said, okay. Tuesday. <laughs> I said, Dr. Foote? Do you have anything for me? Anything he said, no, no. I said, check back another time. And it was another time. I went on Wednesday. He said, are you going to do this every day? I said, yes. He said, okay, I have something for you. So he assigned me the job actually of taking care of a rabbit colony. I had about five rooms of rabbits that, that I got to care for. I got, I got to know the rabbits very well. They got to know me. They loved me because I fed them. And I would walk into the room and the rabbits would, um, would grab onto the front of the cages with their teeth and they'd start rattling the cages. So when I would walk into the room in the morning, there'd be an incredible din of these cages. Shake, 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 shake. And then as I went down the rows, giving each one a scoop, it would get quieter and quieter and quieter. And then I'd finish up and then I'd stand there and I'd listen. And sometimes I'd hear like one little cage still, tick, 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 tick. and I'd go down there and say, oh, I was working too fast and I skipped that one. And they wouldn't let me skip them. But in the meantime, I realized that um, the reason the rabbits were there was we were doing some very interesting work that, that was um, affecting fertility and, and uh, reproduction in, in humans. In fact, some of the earliest work on, on embryo transfers uh, for assisted human reproduction came from, from, from that laboratory. So it was, it was an exciting time. He had a big group, and we talked about research a lot. And I learned to work very fast on the job that, what, that I was being paid for because I wanted to come out and volunteer with the other graduate students. And in a fairly short period of time, he had to hire somebody else to take care of the rabbits because the graduate students came to depend on me to help them with their research project. So I sort of moved my, I promoted myself from rabbit caretaker to a research assistant um, without Dr. Foote knowing that. But he was okay with that because he really wanted to encourage this, this uh, enthusiasm and passion for research. So, uh, so I ended up uh, not applying to vet school when, as, as this experience taught me something about what the research uh, life was all about, what, what kinds of impacts we could have in a much broader way than, than working with, any, with individual animals one at a time, but rather, but rather addressing broader questions that affect uh, human health, global global uh, reproduction control, global food production issues, it was very exciting to me. And that was sort of my first introduction to, to an appreciation of, of agriculture and the research that's so essential to make us a great food production country that we are. So I went on to uh, get my, uh, my master's in his laboratory and then we just talked about my PhD a little bit and he said, you know, uh, it's time for you to move on from Cornell. You've got two degrees here. You should go see some other part of, the, of this academic discipline. So I went to uh, Davis, California, where I, where I worked with a professor named Edward Price whose interest was in reproductive behavior and in particular looking at uh, ways to make uh, food production systems in the, in the beef industry and in other industries as well more efficient for, for the farmers. And so I, I received my PhD actually in animal, be it was an animal behavior degree, and we studied all the basic work that you know of, of Lorenz and Ron Frisch and the, the famous animal behaviorists, but actually there was a, a growing field in, of people interested in this uh, domestic animal area, and, and that's where I started to carve out my niche. And, um, so as the usual academic life proceeds, you, you finish your degree and then you think about, well, can I find a faculty position? The reality is very few people move directly from their graduate training into faculty positions. They take on postdoctoral positions. So I, I 
continued my research as a postdoc in a couple different locations. And the last postdoc before coming here to Rutgers was at the University of California, Berkeley. It was very nice that I was working there, and at the same time, my wife was uh, training to become an optometrist at that, at that school. So it was nice. We actually had a few years where we got to commute together every morning and sort of plan out our day, and then she would go off to her classes, and I would go off to the lab, and then we uh, reconnected at the end of the day. So those were wonderful, wonderful days. I saw an ad in Science Magazine um, around the time she was graduating for an animal science faculty position at Rutgers University. I had heard of Rutgers at that time, didn't know too much about it, I knew it was in New Jersey, that scared me. <laughs> Luckily, one of my classmates from Cornell was a faculty member in animal science at Rutgers, so I gave him a call and we started to talk about the position and what it's like here. And I said, you know, actually that sounds pretty nice, I think I might apply for the position. Who's the chair of the search committee? He said, I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very nice. <laughs> So um, I applied, I sent my, my CV in and a cover letter and I asked a few folks if they would be my personal reference and um, uh, my postdoc advisor at the time, his name was Carl Nickel, who's very, very well known in, in his field uh, for his research, in fact trained many of the people around the country who were uh, at that time senior faculty in many places and his wife later told me that in his recommendation letter, uh, I think he said, to the chair of the animal science department. Yeah, well, he's the next best thing since sliced bread. So that was a pretty good, pretty good recommendation coming from somebody with his his credentials. They asked me to come out to interview. So at the time, they said, uh, book your airline flight from California to uh, Newark. We'll pick you up at the airport, and then we'll reimburse you for your tickets. Now my parents are in Albany, New York, and I I looked into the price of the tickets and discovered that if I fly from Newark up to Albany and then back to California, I, s I can say Rutgers University, about $200 on the price of the tickets. So I called the chair at the time and said, um, uh, Dr. Skeynes, is it okay if I um, add to this flight itinerary a trip to visit my folks up in Albany? Uh, it'll save you a couple hundred dollars. He said, say hello to mom and dad. <laughs> I came out for the interview. They schedule, if, if you've uh, not experienced one of these interviews when you're trying to become a faculty member somewhere, it's pretty grueling. Uh, you start about 7 o'clock in the morning with meetings with faculty and administrators, and at about every 30 to 45 minutes or so, you're meeting with another after another after another after another. Then you give a seminar, and then you continue meeting with more and more of the faculty administration. So they, worry, they try to wear you out pretty good. That's probably the test. It was uh, in the second day of the interview when we went to um, lunch the building just beyond the, the trees here at the Cook Campus Center. I had a meatball parmesan sandwich, which was the first mistake. <laughs> I had read stories about interviews. They said, don't eat food that will make you look messy. <laughs> meatball parms are hard to eat. Why do I remember what I ate? Because on the interview, at lunch, I was offered the position. That was pretty exciting. Uh, my legs started shaking so hard, I think I was moving the table at the time. And, um, and I had in my mind, you know, if I get offered this job, I'm going to ask for this, I'm going to ask for that. And he came out with an initial offering that was a little more than I was going to ask for, so now I didn't even know how to negotiate. I wasn't <laughs> completely unprepared for the, for the offer, so I, you know, I said yes. So imagine my parents' reaction. They know, obviously, they're happy that I'm coming to visit from California, but not only am I coming to visit them from California, but I'm coming up there now with the message that, oh, by the way, we're moving back east. So that was a pretty memorable and fantastic occurrence. So I had a pretty good feeling about this place right from the beginning. Nobody gets offered a job on, on during the interview, so I thought, I, I, I kind of like the way they do things around there. <laughs> Make a decision. 